Ray Bradbury's The Halloween Tree, as read by Jonathan Boone. This reading is dedicated to Johann and Isaac Spilger. May this tale bring you light frights on each and every Halloween night. From the author. With love, from Madame Mana Guro Dumsau, met in 1945 in the graveyard at midnight on the island of Jacinto at Lake Patsacuro, Mexico, and remembered on each anniversary of the Day of the Dead. Ray Bradbury's The Halloween Tree Chapter 1 It was a small town by a small river and a small lake in a small northern part of a Midwest state. There wasn't so much wilderness around you couldn't see the town, but on the other hand, there wasn't so much town around you couldn't see and feel and touch and smell the wilderness. The town was full of trees and dry grass and dead flowers now that autumn was here, and full of fences to walk on and sidewalks to skate on, and a large ravine to tumble in and yell across, and the town was full of boys. And it was the afternoon of Halloween, and all the houses shut against a cold wind, and a town full of cold sunlight, but suddenly the day was gone. Night came out from under each tree and spread. Behind the doors of all the houses there was a scurry of mouse feet, muted cries, flickerings of light. Behind one door, Tom Skeleton, aged 13, stopped and listened. The wind outside nestled in each tree, prowled the sidewalks in invisible treads like unseen cats. Tom Skeleton shivered. Anyone could see that the wind was a special wind this night, and the darkness took on a special feel because it was All Hallows' Eve. Everything seemed cut from black velvet or gold or orange velvet. Smoke panted out from a thousand chimneys like the plumes of funeral parades. From kitchen windows drifted two pumpkin smells, gourds being cut, pies being baked. The cries behind the locked house doors grew more exasperated as shadows of boys flew by windows. Half-dressed boys, grease paint on their cheeks, here a hunchback, there a medium-sized giant. Attics were still being rummaged, old locks broken, old steamer chests disemboweled for costumes. Tom Skeleton put on his bones. He grinned at the special cord, the rib cage, the kneecaps stitched white on black cotton. Lucky, he thought. What a name you've got, Tom Skeleton. Great for Halloween. Everyone calls you Skeleton, so what do you wear? Bones. Wham! Eight front doors banged shut. Eight boys made a series of beautiful leaps over flower pots, rails, dead ferns, bushes, landing on their own dry, starched front lawns. Galloping, rushing, they seized a final sheet, adjusted a last mask, tugged at a strange mushroom caps or wig, shouting at the way the wind took them along, helped their running, glad of the wind, or cursing boy curses as masks fell off or hung sideways or stuffed up their noses with the smell of muslin smell like a dog's hot breath, or just letting out the sheer exhilaration of being alive and out on this night pull their lungs and shape their throats into a yell and a yell and a yell. Eight boys collided at one intersection. Here I am, witch, ape man, skeleton, said Tom, hilarious inside his bones. Gargoyle, beggar, Mr. Death himself. Bang, they shook back from their concussions, all happy fouled and tangled under a street corner light. The swaying electric lamp belled in the wind like a cathedral bell. The bricks of the street became planks of a drunken ship, all tilted and foundered with dark and light. Behind each mask was a boy. Who's that? Tom Skeleton pointed. Won't tell. Secret. 
cried the witch, disguising his voice. Everyone laughed. Who's that? Mummy, cried the boy inside the ancient yellowed wrappings like an immense cigar stalking the night streets. And who's... No time, said someone behind yet another mystery of muslin and paint. Trick or treat! Yeah! Shrieking, wailing, full of banshee mirth, they ran on everything except sidewalks, going up into the air over bushes and down almost upon yipping dogs. In the middle of running, laughing, barking, suddenly, as a great hand of night and wind and smelling something wrong stopped them, they stopped. Six, seven, eight. That can't be. Count again. Four, five, six. Should be nine of us. Someone's missing. They sniffed each other like fearful beasts. Pipkin's not here. How did they know? They were all hidden behind masks, and yet, and yet, they could feel his absence. Pipkin, he's never missed a Halloween in a zillion years. Boy, this is awful. Come on. In one vast swerve, one dog-like trot and ramble, they circled round and down the middle of a cobble brick street, blown like leaves before a storm. Here's his place. They pulled to a halt. There was Pipkin's house, but not enough pumpkins in the windows, not enough corn shocks on the porch, not enough spooks peering out through the dark glass in the high upstairs tower room. Gosh, someone said. What if Pipkin's sick? It wouldn't be Halloween without Pipkin. Not Halloween, they moaned. And someone threw a crab apple at Pipkin's front door. It made a small thump like a rabbit kicking the wood. They waited, sad for no reason, lost for no reason. They thought of Pipkin and Halloween that might be a rotten pumpkin with a dead candle if, if, if Pipkin wasn't there. Come on, Pippin, come out and save the night. Chapter 2 Why were they waiting, afraid for one small boy? Because... Joe Pipkin was the greatest boy who ever lived. The grandest boy who ever fell out of a tree and laughed at the joke. The finest boy who ever raced down the track, winning, and then, seeing his friends a mile back somewhere, stumbled and fell, waited for them to catch up, and joined, breast and breast, breaking the winner's tape. The jolliest boy who ever hunted out all the haunted houses in town, which are hard to find, and came back to report on them, and to take all the kids to ramble through the basements and scramble up the ivy outside bricks and shout down the chimneys and make water off the roofs, hooting and chimpanzee dancing and ape bellowing. The day Joe Pipkin was born, all the orange crush and knee-high soda bottles in the world fizzed over, and joyful bees swarmed countrysides to sting maiden ladies. On his birthday, the lake pulled out from the shore in midsummer and ran back with a tidal wave of boys, a big leap of bodies and a down crash of laughs. Dawns, lying in bed, you heard a bird peck out the window. Pipkin, you stuck your head out into the snow water clear summer morning air. And there, in the dew on the lawn, rabbit prints showed where, just a moment ago, not a dozen rabbits, but one rabbit, had circled and crisscrossed in a glory of life and exultation, bounding hedges, clipping ferns, tromping clover. It resembled the switch yards down at the rail depot. A million tracks in the grass, but no pipkin. And here he rose up like a wild sunflower in the garden. His great round face burned with fresh sun. His eyes flashed Morse code signals. Hurry up. It's almost over. What? Today. Now. 6 a.m. Dive down. Wade in it. Or, this is summer before you know. Bang! It's gone. Quick! And he sank away in sunflowers to come up all onions. Pipkin. Oh, dear Pipkin. Finest and loveliest of boys. How he ran so fast, no one knew. His tennis shoes were ancient. 
They were colored green a forest jogged through, brown from old harvest trudges through September a year back, tar stained from sprints along the docks and beaches where the coal barges came in, yellow from careless dogs, splinter filled from climbing wood fences. His clothes were scarecrow clothes, worn by Pipkin's dogs at night, loaned to them for strolls through town, with chew marks along the cuffs and fall marks on the seat. His hair? His hair was a great hedgehog bristle of bright, brown, blonde daggers sticking in all directions. His ears? Pure peach fuzz. His hands? Bitten with dust and the good smell of Airedales and peppermint and stolen peaches from the country farm orchards. Pipkin, an assemblage of speeds, smells, textures, a cross-section of all the boys who ever ran, fell, got up, and ran again. No one in all the years had ever seen him sitting still. He was hard to remember in school, one seat for one hour. He was the last into the schoolhouse, and the first exploded out when the bell ended the day. Pipkin, sweet Pipkin, who yodeled and played the kazoo and hated girls more than all the other boys in the gang combined. Pipkin, whose arm around your shoulder and secret whisperings of great doings this day protected you from the world. Pipkin. God got up early just to see Pipkin come out of his house, like one of those people on a weather clock, and the weather was always fine where Pipkin was. Pipkin. They stood in front of his house. Any moment now, that door would open wide. Pipkin would jump out in a blast of fire and smoke, and Halloween would really begin. Come on, Joe. Oh, Pipkin, they whispered. Come on. Chapter 3 The front door opened. Pipkin stepped out. Not flew, not banged, not exploded. Stepped out and came down the walk to meet his friends, not running and not wearing a mask. No mask, but moving along like an old man, almost. Pipkin, they shouted to scare away their uneasiness. Hi, gang, said Pipkin. His face was pale. He tried to smile, but his eyes looked funny. He was holding his right side with one hand as if he had a boil there. They all looked at his hand. He took his hand away from his side. Well, he said with faint enthusiasm, we ready to go? Yeah, but you don't look ready, said Tom. You sick? On Halloween, said Pipkin. You kidding? Where's your costume? You go ahead. I'll catch up. No, Pipkin, we'll wait for you to go on, said Pipkin, saying it slowly, his face deathly pale now. His hand was back on his side. You got a stomach ache? asked Tom. You told your folks? No. No, I, I can't. They tears burst from Pipkin's eyes. It's nothing, I tell you. Look, go straight toward the ravine. Head for the house, okay? The place of the haunts, yeah? Meet you there. You swear? Swear. Wait till you see my costume. The boys began to back off. On the way, they touched his elbow, or knocked him gently in the chest, or ran their knuckles along his chin in a fake fight. Okay, Pipkin, as long as you're sure. I'm sure. He shook his hand away from his side, his face colored for a moment as if the pain were gone. On your marks, get set, go. When Joe Pipkin said go, they went. They ran. They ran backward halfway down the block so you could see Pipkin standing there waving at them. Hurry, Pipkin! I'll catch you, he shouted a long way off. The night swallowed him. They ran. When they looked back again, he was gone. They banged doors, they shouted trick-or-treat, 
and their brown paper bags began to fill with incredible sweets. They galloped with their teeth glued shut with pink gum. They ran with red wax lips bedazzling their faces. But all the people who met them at doors looked like candy factory duplicates of their own mothers and fathers. It was like never leaving home. Too much kindness flashed from every window and every portal. What they wanted was to hear dragons belch in basements and banged castle doors. And so, still looking back for Pipkin, they reached the edge of town and the place where civilization fell away into darkness. The ravine. The ravine, filled with varieties of night sounds, lurkings of black ink stream and creek, lingerings of autumn that rolled over in fire and bronze and died a thousand years ago. From this deep place sprang mushroom and toadstool and cold stone frog and crawdad and spider. There was a long tunnel down there under the earth in which poisoned waters dripped and the echoes never ceased calling, Come, 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 and if you do, you'll stay forever, forever, drip, forever, rustle, rush, run, whisper, and never go, never go, go, go. The boys lined up on the rim of darkness, looking down. And then Tom Skeleton, cold in his bones, whistled his breath and his teeth like wind blowing over the bedroom screen at night. He pointed. Oh, hey, that's where Pipkin told us to go. He vanished. All looked. They saw his small shape race down the dirt path into a hundred million tons of night crammed in that huge dark pit, that dank cellar, that deliciously frightening ravine. Yelling, they plunged after. Where they had been was empty. The town was left behind to suffer itself with sweetness. Chapter 4 They ran down through the ravine in a swift rush, all laughing, jostling, all elbows and ankles, all steamy snort and rust about, to stop in collision when Tom Skeleton stopped and pointed up the path. There, he whispered. There's the only house in town worth visiting on Halloween. There! Yeah, said everyone. For it was true. The house was special and fine and tall and dark. There must have been a thousand windows in its side, all shimmering with cold stars. It looked as if it had been cut out of black marble instead of built out of timbers. And inside? Who could guess how many rooms, halls, breezeways, attics? Superior and inferior attics, some higher than others, some more filled with dust and webs and ancient leaves of gold buried above ground in the sky, but lost away so high no ladder in town could take you there. The house beckoned with its towers, invited with its gummed shut doors. Pirate ships are a tonic, ancient forts are a boon, but a house, a haunted house, on All Hallows' Eve? Eight small hearts beat up an absolute storm of glory and approbation. Come on. But they were already crowding up the path, until they stood at last by a crumbling wall, looking up and up and still farther up at the great tomb-yard top of the old house. For that's what it seemed. The high mountain peak of the mansion was littered with what looked like black bones or iron rods and enough chimneys to choke out smoke signals from three dozen fires and sooty hearths hidden far below the dim bowels of this monster place. With so many chimneys, the roof seemed a vast cemetery, each chimney signifying the burial place of some old god of fire or enchantress of steam, smoke, and firefly spark. Even as they watched, 
a kind of black exaltation of soot breathed up out of some four dozen flues, darkening the sky still more and putting out some few stars. Boy, said Tom Skeleton, Pipkin sure knows what he's talking about. Boy, said all agreeing. They crept along a weed-infested path toward the crumpled front porch. Tom Skeleton, alone, itched his bony foot up on the front porch step. The others grasped at his bravery. So now, finally in a mob, a compact mass of sweating boys moved up the porch amid fierce cries of the planks underfoot and shudderings of their bodies. Each wished to pull back, swivel about, run, but found himself trapped against the boy behind or in front or to the side. So in a pseudopod thrust out here or there, the amoebic form, the large perspiration of boys leaned and made a run and a stop to the front door of the house which was as tall as a coffin and twice as thin. They stood there a long moment, various hands reaching out like the legs of an immense spider, as if to twist that cold knob or to reach up for that knocker on front of the door. Meanwhile, the wooden floorings of the porch sank and wallowed beneath their weight, threatening at every shift of proposition to give way and to fling them into some cockroach abyss beneath. The planks, each tuned to an A or an F or a C, sang out their uncanny music as heavy shoes scraped on them. And if there had been time, and it were noon, they might have danced out a cadaver's tune or a skeleton's rigadoon, for who can resist an ancient porch which, like a gigantic xylophone, only wants to be jumped on to make music. But they were not thinking this. Henry Hank Smith, for that's who it was, hidden inside his black witch's costume, cried, Look! All looked at the knocker on the door. Tom's hand trembled out to touch it. A Marley knocker! What? You know, Scrooge and Marley, a Christmas carol, whispered Tom. And indeed that face that made up the knocker on the door was the face of a man with a dreaded toothache, his jaw bandaged, his hair askew, his teeth prolapsed, his eyes wild. Dead as a doornail Marley, friend to Scrooge and habiter of lands beyond the grave, doomed to wander this earth forever until... Knock, said Henry Hank. Tom Skeleton took a hold of old Marley's cold and grisly jaw, lifted it, and let it fall. All jumped at the concussion. The entire house shook. Its bones ground together. Shades snap furled so that the windows blinked wide with their ghastly eyes. Tom Skeleton cat leaped to the porch rail, staring up. On the rooftop, weird weathercocks spun. Two headed roosters whirled in the sneezed wind. A gargoyle on the western rim of the house erupted twin snorts of rain funnel dust. And down the long, snaking, serpentine rain spouts of the house, after the sneeze had died and the weathercocks ceased spinning, Vagrant wisps of autumn leaf and cobweb fell, gusting out into the dark grass. Tom whirled to look at the faintly shuddering windows. Moonlit reflections trembled in the grass like schools of disturbed silver minnows. And the front door gave a shake, a twist of its knob, a grimace of its marley knocker, and flung itself wide. The wind made by the suddenly opening door almost knocked the boys off the porch. They seized one another's elbows, yelling. Then the darkness within the house inhaled. A wind sucked through the gaping door. It pulled at the boys, dragging them across the porch. They had to lean back so as not to be snatched into the deep, dark hall. They struggled, shouted, clutched the porch rails, but then the wind ceased. 
darkness moved within darkness. Inside the house, a long way off, someone was walking toward the door. Whoever it was must have been dressed in all black, for they could see nothing but the pale white face drifting on the air. An evil smile came and hung in the doorway before them. Behind the smile, the tall man hid in shadow. They could see his eyes now, small pinpoints of green fire and little charred pits of sockets, looking out at them. Well, said Tom, uh, trick or treat? Trick? said the smile in the dark. Treat? Uh, y yes, sir. The wind played a flute in a chimney somewhere, an old song about time and dark and far places. The tall man shut up his smile like a bright pocket knife. No treats, he said. Only trick! The door slammed. The house thundered with showers of dust. Dust puffed out of the rain spout again in fluffs, like an emergence of downy cats. Dust gasped from open windows. Dust snorted from the porch boards under their feet. The boys stared at the locked, shut fast front door. The Marley knocker was not scowling now, but smiling, an evil smile. What's he mean? asked Tom. No treats? Only trick? Backing off, around the side of the house, they were astonished at the sounds it made. A whole rigmarole of whispers, squeaks, creaks, wails, and murmurs, and the night wind was careful to let the boys hear them all. With every step they took, the great house leaned after them with soft groans. They rounded the far side of the house and stopped, for there was the tree and it was such a tree as they had never seen in all their lives. It stood in the middle of a vast yard behind the terribly strange house, and this tree rose up some one hundred feet in the air, taller than the high roofs, and full, and round, and well-branched, and covered all over with rich assortments of red, and brown, and yellow autumn leaves. But, whispered Tom, Oh, look, what's up in that tree? For the tree was hung with a variety of pumpkins of every shape and size, a number of tints and hues of smoky yellow or bright orange. A pumpkin tree? Someone said. No, said Tom. The wind blew among the high branches and tossed their bright burdens softly. A Halloween tree, said Tom. And he was right. Chapter 5 The pumpkins on the tree were not mere pumpkins. Each had a face sliced in it. Each face was different. Every eye was a stranger eye. Every nose a weirder nose. Every mouth smiled hideously in some new way. There must have been a thousand pumpkins on this tree, hung high and on every branch. A thousand smiles, a thousand grimaces, and twice times a thousand glares and winks and blinks and leerings of fresh-cut eyes. And as the boys watched, a new thing happened. The pumpkins began to come to life. One by one, starting at the bottom of the tree and the nearest pumpkins, candles took fire within the raw interiors. This one, then that and this, and then still another, and up on and around, three pumpkins here, seven pumpkins still higher, a dozen clustered beyond, a hundred, five hundred, a thousand pumpkins lit their candles, which is to say brightened up their faces, showed fire in their square, or round, or curiously slanted eyes. Flame guttered in their toothed mouths, Sparks leapt out their ripe-cut ears, and from somewhere two voices, three or maybe four voices, whispered and chanted a kind of sing-song or old she-shanty 
of sky and time and the earth turned over into sleep. The rain spouts spewed spider dust. It's big, it's broad. A voice smoked from the rooftop chimney. It's broad, it's bright. It fills the sky of all hollows night. From open windows somewhere, cobwebs drifted. The strangest sight you've ever seen. The monster tree on Halloween. The candles flickered and flared. The wind crooned in, the wind crooned out, the pumpkin mouths tuning the song. The leaves have burned to gold and red. The grass is brown, the old year dead. But hang the harvest high, oh see, the candle constellations on the Halloween tree. Tom felt his mouth stir like a small mouse wanting to sing. The stars they turn, the candles burn, and the mouse leaves scurry on the cold wind. Born. And a mob of smiles shine down on thee From the cords hung high on the Halloween tree The smile of the witch, the smile of the cat The smile of the beast, the smile of the bat The smile of the reaper taking his fee all cut and glimmer on the Halloween tree. Smoke seemed to sift from Tom's mouth. Halloween tree. All the boys whispered it. Halloween tree. And then there was silence. And during the silence, the last of the triples and quadruples of All Hallows' tree candles were lit in titanic constellations woven through the black branches and peeking down through the twigs and crisp leaves. And the tree had now become one vast, substantial smile. The last of the pumpkins now were lit. The air around the tree was an Indian summer breathing warm. The tree exhaled sooty smoke and raw pumpkin smell upon them. Gosh, said Tom Skeleton. Hey, hey, what kind of place is this? asked Henry Hank, the witch. I mean, first the house, that man, and no treats, only tricks. And now? I never saw a tree like this in all my life. Like a Christmas tree, only bigger. And all those candles and pumpkins? What's it mean? What's it celebrate? Celebrate? A vast voice whispered somewhere, perhaps in a chimney soot bellows, or perhaps all the windows of the house opened like mouths at the same time behind them, sliding up, sliding down, announcing the word celebrate, with breathings out of darkness. Yes, said the gigantic whisper, which trembled the candles and the pumpkins. Celebration. The boys leaped around, but the house was still, the windows were closed and brimmed with pools of moonlight. Last one in's the old maid, cried Tom suddenly, and a bond of leaves lay waiting like old fire's old gold and the boys ran and dived at the huge, lovely pile of autumn treasure. And in the moment of diving, about to vanish beneath the leaves of crisp swarms, yelling, shouting, shoving, falling, there was an immense gulp of breath, a seizing in of air. The boys yelped, pulled back as if an invisible whip had struck them, for coming up out of the pile was a bony white hand all by itself, and following it, all smiles, hidden one moment but now revealed as it slid upwards, was a white skull, and what had been a delicious pool of oak and elm and poplar leaves 
to thrash and sink and hide in, now became the last place on all this world the boys wanted to be. For the white bony hand was flying on the air, and the white skull rose to hover before them, and the boys fell back, colliding, sneezing out their air in panics, until in one wild mass they fell flat upon the earth and writhed and tore at the grass to fight free, scramble, to try to run. Help! they cried. Oh, yes, help, said the skull. Then peal after peal of laughter froze them further as the hand upon the air, the bony skeleton hand, reached up, took hold of the white skull face, and peeled it down and off. The boys blinked once behind their masks. Their jaws dropped, though none could see them dropping. The huge man in dark clothes soared up out of the leaves, taller and yet taller. He grew like a tree. He put out branches that were his hands. He stood framed against the Halloween tree itself his outstretched arms and long, white, bony fingers festooned with orange globes of fire and burning smiles. His eyes were pressed tight as he roared his laughter. His mouth gaped wide and let an autumn wind rush out. Not treat, boys, no, not treat. Trick, boys, trick, trick. They lay there waiting for the earthquake to come. And it came. The tall man's laughter shook hold of the ground and gave it a shake. This tremor passed through their bones, came out their mouths, and it came out in the form of still more laughter. They sat up amid the ruins of the thrashed-about leaf pile, surprised. They put their hands to their masks to feel the hot air leaping out the small gusts of echoing mirth. Then they looked up at the man as if to verify their surprise. Yes, boys, that, that was a trick. You'd forgotten. No, you never knew. And he leaned against the tree, finishing out his fits of happiness, shaking the trunk, making the thousands of pumpkins shiver in the fires inside smoke and dance. Warmed by their laughter, the boys got up to feel their bones and to see if anything was broken. Nothing was. They stood in a small mob under the Halloween tree, waiting, for they knew this was only the beginning of something new and special and grand and fine. Well, said Tom Skeleton. Well, Tom? 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 cried everyone else. Is that you? Tom, in the skeleton mask, stiffened. Or is it Bob or Fred? No, no, that must be Ralph, said the man quickly. All of those, sighed Tom, clapping his mask hard in place, relieved. Yeah, all, said everyone. The man nodded, smiling. Well, now... Now you know something about Halloween you never knew before. How did you like my trick? Trick, yes, trick. The boys were catching fire with the idea. It made all the glue go out of their joints and put a little dust of sin in their blood. They felt it stir around until it pumped on up to light their eyes and stretch their lips to show their happy dog teeth. Yeah, sure. This is what you used to do on Halloween, asked the witch boy. This and more. But let me introduce myself. Moundshroud's the name. Carapace Clavicle Moundshroud. Does that have a ring, boys? Does it sound for you? It sounds, the boys thought. Oh, it sounds. Moundshroud. A fine name, said Mr. Moundshroud, giving a full sepulchral night church sound. A fine night. 
and all the deep, dark, wild, long history of Halloween waiting to swallow us whole. Swallow us? Yes, cried Mount Shroud. Lads, look at yourselves. Why are you, boy, wearing that skull face? And you, boy, carrying a scythe? And you, lad, made up like a witch? And you, and you, and you! He thrust his bony finger at each mask. You don't know, do you? You just put on those faces and old mothball clothes and jump out, but you don't really know, do you? Well, said Tom, a mouse behind his skull-white muslin. Uh, no. Yeah, said the devil boy. Come to think of it, why am I wearing this? He fingered his red cloak and sharp rubber horns and lovely pitchfork. And me this, said the ghost, trailing its long white graveyard sheets. And the boys were given to wonder and touch their own costumes and refit their own masks. Then, wouldn't it be fun for you to find out? asked Mr. Mound Shroud. I'll tell you. No, I'll show you. If only there was time. It's only 6.30. Halloween hasn't even begun, said Tom in his cold bones. True, said Mr. Mount Shroud. All right, lads, come along. He strode. They ran. At the edge of the deep, dark night ravine, he pointed over the rim of the hills and the earth, away from the light of the moon, under the dim light of strange stars. The wind fluttered his black cloak, and the hood that sh half shadowed and now half revealed his almost fleshless face. There, do you see it, lads? What? The undiscovered country. Out there. Look long, look deep, make a feast. The past, boys, the past. Oh, it's dark, yes, and full of nightmare. Everything that Halloween ever was lies buried there. Will you dig for bones, boys? Do you have the stuff? He burned his gaze at them. What is Halloween? How did it start? Where? Why? What for? Witches? Cats? Mummy dust? Haunts? It's all there in that country from which no one returns. Will you dive into the dark ocean, boys? Will you fly into the dark sky? The boys swallowed hard. Someone peeped. We'd like to, but Pipkin... We've got to wait for Pipkin. Yeah, but Pipkin sent us to your place. We couldn't go on without him. As if summoned in this instant, they heard a cry from the far side of the ravine. Hey, here I am, cried a frail voice. They saw his small figure standing with a lit pumpkin on the far ravine ledge. This way, they all yelled. Pipkin! Quick! Coming! was the cry. I don't feel so good, but I had to come. Wait for me. Chapter 6 They saw his small figure run down the middle of the ravine on the path. Oh, wait, please wait, the voice began to fail. I don't feel well. I can't run. Can't. Can't. Pipkin! Everyone shouted, waving from the ledge of the cliff. His figure was small, small, small. There were shadows mixed everywhere. Bats flew, owls shrieked, night ravens clustered like black leaves in trees. A small boy, running with his lit pumpkin, fell. Oh, gasped Mount Shroud. The pumpkin light went out. Oh, gasped everyone. Light your pumpkin, Pip. Light it. 
He thought he saw the small figure scrambling in the dark grass below, trying to strike a light. But in that instant of darkness, the night swept in. A great wing folded over the abyss. Many owls hooted, many mice scampered and slithered in the shadows. A million tiny murders happened somewhere. Light your pumpkin, Pip! Help! wailed his sad voice. A thousand wings flew away. A great beast beat the air somewhere like a thumping drum. The clouds, like gauzy scenes, were pulled away to set a clean sky. The moon was there, a great eye. It looked down upon an empty path. Pipkin, nowhere to be seen. Way off, toward the horizon, Something dark frittered and danced and slithered away in the cold star air. Help! Help! wailed a fading voice, and then it was gone. Oh, mourned Mr. Mountroud. This is bad. I fear something has taken him away. Where? Where? gibbered the boys, cold. To the undiscovered country, the place I wanted to show you, but now, you don't mean that thing in the ravine, it, or, or him, or whatever, that something, was death? Did he grab Pipkin and run? Borrowed is more like it, perhaps to hold him for ransom, said Mount Shroud. Can death do that? Sometimes, yes. Oh, gosh, Tom felt his eyes water. Pip, tonight, running, so slow, so pale. Pip, you shouldn't have come out, he shouted at the sky, but there was only wind there and white clouds floating like old spirit fluff on a clear river of wind. They stood, cold and shivering. They looked off to where the dark something had stolen their friend. So said Mount Shroud. All the more reason for you to come along, lads. If we fly fast, maybe we can catch Pipkin. Grab his sweet Halloween candy corn soul. Bring him back. Pop him into bed. Toast him warm. Save his breath. What say, lads? Would you solve two mysteries in one? Search and seek for lost Pipkin and solve Halloween? All in one fell dark blow? They thought of All Hallows' Night and the billion ghosts wandering the lonely lanes and cold winds and strange smokes. They thought of Pipkin, no more than a thimbleful of boy in sheer summer delight, torn out like a tooth and carried off on a black tide of web and horn and black soot. And, almost as one, they murmured, Yes. Mount Shroud sprang. He ran, he pummeled, he pushed, he raved. Quick now, along this path, up this rise, along this road, the abandoned farm, over the fence, a lazo! They leaped the fence running, and they stood by a barn that was frosted over with old circus posters, with banners tattering by the wind pasted here thirty, forty, fifty years back. Circuses, passing through, had left patches and swatches of themselves ten inches thick. A kite, boys! Build a kite! Quick! Chapter 7 No sooner had he cried this than Mr. Moundshroud ripped a great tissue from the side of the barn. It fluttered in his hands, the eye of a tiger. Another rip from another ancient poster, the mouth of of a lion. The boys heard roars of Africa down the wind. They blinked, they ran, they scratched with fingernails, they plucked with hands, they seized off strips and patches and huge rolls of animal flesh, of fang and piercing eye, of wounded flank, of blood red claw, of tail, of bound and leap and cry. The whole side of the barn was an ancient parade stopped dead. They tore it asunder. 
and with each tear that pulled off talon, tongue, or ravening feline eye. Beneath waited layer upon layer of jungle nightmare, delicious encounters with polar bears, panicked zebra, kneeling prides of lions, charging rhinos, clampering gorillas which pawed up the side of midnight and swung toward dawn. A thousand animals in congregation rumbling to be set free, now free in fists and hands and fingers, whistling on the autumn wind, the boys raced off across the grass. Now, Mountrow knocked down old fence-railing beams and made a rough kite cross and bound them with wire, then stood back to receive the gifts of kite paper as the boys flung them in fistfuls. And these he tossed in place upon the frame, and spark flinting, fused with the burnings of his horny hands. Hey! The boys cried in their delight. Oh, look! They had never seen such things, or known that men such as Mound Shroud with a pinch, a clutch, pressure of fingers might blend an eye with a tooth, a tooth with a mouth, a mouth with feline bobcat tail. All, all mingled beautifully into a single thing, a wild jigsaw puzzled, jew zoo billowed and trapped, pasted and tied, growing, growing, taking color and sound and pattern in the light of the ascending moon. Now another cannibal eye, now another hungry maw, a mad chimpanzee, a most insane mandrill ape, a screaming butcher bird. The boys ran up with the last frights handed over and the kite finished, the ancient flesh laid out, fused by the still blue smoke burning horny hands. Mr. Moundtrow lit a cigar with the last bit of fire that sparked out of his thumb and smiled. And the light from his smile showed the kite for what it was, a kite of destructions, of animals so dire and fierce their outcry drowned the wind and murdered the heart. He was pleased. The boys were pleased. For the kite somehow seemed to resemble... Why said Tom, astounded. A pterodactyl! A what? Pterodactyl. Those ancient flying reptiles gone some billion years back and never seen again, replied Mr. Moundshroud. Well said, boy. Pterodactyl it seems and is, and twill fly us downwind to perdition or land's end or some other fine-sounding place. But now, rope, twine, string, quick, flitch and carry. They ran the rope off an old abandoned clothesline strung between bar and abandoned farmhouse. A good ninety feet or more of rope they brought Mound Shroud, who snaked it through his fist until it smoked the most unholy smoke. He tied it to the middle of the vast kite, which flapped like a somehow lost and out-of-water manta ray upon this high, strange beach. It struggled with wind to live. It flapped and floundered on the heaves of tidal air, laid down on grass. Mound Shroud stood back, and gave a jerk and a low. The kite flew. It hung low upon the air at the end of its closed line, and in a dumb, brute groveling of wind, veering this way, dashing that, leaping suddenly to confront them with the walls of eyes of solid flesh of teeth, a storm of cries. It won't rise. Won't go straight. A tail. We need a tail. And as if by instinct, Tom dived first, and seized the kite by its bottom. He hung there. The kite steadied. It began to rise. Yes, cried the dark man. Oh, lad, you are the one. Bright boy, you be the tail, and, and more, and more. And as the kite slowly ascended the cold river of swift flowing air, each boy in turn, seized with the whim, spurred by his wits, became more and yet more of the tail which is to say that Henry Hank, disguised as a witch, grabbed Tom's ankles, and now the kite had two boys for its magnificent tail. And Ralph Bengstrom, wound up in his mummy's clothes, 
stumbling over his winding tapes, smothered in his burial rags, shambled forward, jumped, and grabbed Henry Hank's ankles. So three boys now hung in a tail. Wait, here I come, cried Beggar, who under his dirt and frags was really Fred Fryer. He jumped, he caught. The kite ascended. The four boys making the tail yelled for more length. They got it when the boy dressed as an ape man scrambled and grabbed ankles, followed by the boy dressed as death with a sigh who did dangerously likewise. Watch out with that scythe! The scythe fell and lay in the grass like a lost smile. But the two boys hung down now from all the half-washed ankles, and the kite rose more, higher and higher, adding a boy and a boy and a boy, until with a yell and a shout, eight boys down hung and a magnificent thrashing tail, the last two being Ghost, who was truly George Smith, and Wally Bob, who, inspired, made himself up to look like a gargoyle had fallen off the top of a cathedral. The boys yelled with elation. The kite swooped and took off. Hey! Whoosh! The kite purred with a thousand animal whispers. Wang! The kite rope strummed the wind. Hush! said the entire thing, and the wind flew them high across the stars, leaving Mound Shroud to look up with awe at his contraption, his kite, his boys. Wait! he shouted. Don't wait! Come on! the boys yelled. Mound Shroud ran along the grass to seize the scythe. His cape fluttered, taking air, making wings, until he also, very simply, took off and soared. Chapter 8 The Kite Flew The boys hung down from the kite in a fine lizard's tail, now weaving, now looping, now snapping, now gliding. They yelled with delight. They shrieked with the in-gasped, out-gasped terror. They rode across the moon in an exclamation point. They soared over hills and meadows and farms, they saw themselves reflected in the dusty, moon-bright streams, creeks, rivers. They brushed down over ancient trees. The winds stirred by their passing shook down whole government mints of coins, leaves, bright showering to the black-grassed earth. They flew over the town and thought, Oh, look up! See! Here we are! Your sons! And thought, Oh, look down. There somewhere are our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, teachers. Hey, here we are. Oh, someone see us or you'll never believe. And in a last swoop, the kite whistled, hummed, drummed along the winds to float over the old house and the Halloween tree where they first had met Mound Shroud. Swoop, flutter, glide, rush, hiss. The suction of their swung bodies caused a thousand candles to flutter, flicker, stutter their light, hiss with desire to reflame themselves. So all the hung pumpkin scowls and leers and wild smiles were half snuffed to unhappy shadows. The whole tree went dead for a heartbeat. Then, as the kite sang high, the tree blazed up with a thousand new cut pumpkin frowns, glares, grimaces, and grins. The windows of the house, black mirrors, saw the kite go away and away until the boys and the kite and Mr. Mound Shroud were very small on the horizon. And then down they sailed away deep into the undiscovered country of old death and strange years and the frightful past. Where are we going? cried Tom, hanging to the kite's tail. Yes, where? Where? cried all the boys, one after another, below, below. Not where, but when, said Mound Shroud, pacing them, his great veiled cloak full of moon, wind, and time. Two thousand, count them, years before Christ. Pipkin's there, waiting, I smell it, fly. Then the moon began to blink. 
It closed up its eye, and there was darkness. Then faster and faster it began to wink, to wax, to wane, to wax again, until a thousand times over it flickered, and in flickering changed the landscape below, and then fifty thousand times, so fast they could not see it, the moon extinguished and relit itself. And the moon stopped winking and held very still, and the land was changed. Look, said Mountain Shroud, hung upon the very air above them, and the million tiger, lion, leopard, panther eyes of the autumn kite looked down, as did the eyes of the boys, and the sun rose, showing them Egypt, the river Nile, the Sphinx, the pyramids. But, said Mount Shroud, notice anything different? Why, gasped Tom, it's all new. It's just been built. That, that means we really have gone back in time 4,000 years. And sure enough, the Egypt that lay below was ancient sand but new cut stone. The Sphinx, with its great lion paws, treaded out the gold stuffs of desert, was sharp cut and freshly born out of the womb of stone mountains. It was a vast pup in the bright and empty glare of noon. If the sun had fallen and lay between its paws, it would have been cuffed like a fireball toy. The pyramids? Why, they lay like strange-shaped blocks, yet other games to be puzzled over, played with by the woman lion sphinx. The kite zoomed down and skirted the sand dunes, flirted above one pyramid and was drawn as by suction by an open tomb mouth set in a small cliff. Hey, presto! cried Mount Shroud. With a flap, he gave the kite such a kick as made the boys toll like clamorous bells. Hey, no! they cried. The kite shuddered, fell down, hovered ten feet above the dunes, and shook itself like a wild dog ridding itself of fleas. The boys fell safe in the golden sand. The kite broke away, and a thousand shreds of eyes, fangs, shrieks, roars, elephant trumpetings. The Egyptian tomb mouth sucked them in, and Mount Shroud laughing with it. Mr. Mount Shroud, wait! Leaping up, the boys ran to shout into the dark tomb doorway. Then they lifted their gaze and saw where they were, the Valley of the Kings, where huge stone gods loomed above, dust sifted in a strange downpour of tears from their eyes, tears made of sand and powdered rock. The boys leaned into the shadows. Like a dry river bottom, corridors led down to deep vaults where lay the linen-wrapped dead. Dust fountains echoed and played in strange courtyards a mile below. The boys ached, listening. The tomb breathed out a sick exhalation of paprika, cinnamon, and powdered camel dung. Somewhere, a mummy dreamed, coughed in its sleep, unraveled a bandage, twitched its dusty tongue, and turned over for another thousand-year snooze. Mr. Mount Shroud, called Tom Skelton. Chapter 9 From deep in the dry earth a lost voice whispered, Mount Shroud. Out of the darkness something rolled, rushed, flapped. A long strip of mummy cloth snapped out into the sunlight. It was as if the very tomb itself had stuck out its old dry tongue which lay at their feet. The boys stared. The linen strip was hundreds of yards long and might, if they wished, lead them down, down into the mysterious deeps below the Egyptian earth. Tom Skelton, trembling, put out one toe to touch the yellow linen strip. A wind blew from the tombs, saying, Yeah. 
here I go, said Tom, and, balancing on a tight rope of linen, he wandered down and vanished in the dark under the burial chambers. Yes, whispered the wind coming up from below. The boys raced down the linen path in darkness. Watch for murder, boys. Murder. The pillars on both sides of the rushing boys flashed to life. Pictures shivered and moved. The golden sun was on every pillar, but it was a sun with arms and legs, bound tight with mummy wrappings. A dark creature struck the sun with one dreadful blow. The sun died. Its fires went out. The boys ran blind in darkness. Yeah, thought Tom, running. Sure. I mean, I think every night the sun dies. Going to sleep, I wonder, will it come back? Tomorrow morning, will it still be dead? The boys ran. On the new pillar, dead ahead, the sun appeared again, burning out of an eclipse. Swell, Tom thought. That's it, sunrise. But just as quickly, the sun was murdered again. On each pillar they raced by, the sun died in autumn and was buried in cold winter. Middle of December, Tom thought. I often think, the sun will never come back. Winter will go on forever. This time the sun really is dead. But as the boys slowed at the end of the long corridor, the sun was reborn. Spring arrived with golden horns. Light filled the corridor with pure fire. The strange god stood burning on every wall, his face a grand fire of triumph, wrapped in golden ribbons. Why, heck! I know who that is, panted Henry Hank. Saw him in a movie once with terrible Egyptian mummies. Osiris, said Tom. Yes, hissed Mound Shroud's voice from the deep tombs. Lesson one about Halloween. Osiris, son of the earth and sky, killed each night by his brother in darkness. Osiris, slain by autumn, murdered by his own night blood. So it goes in every country, boys. Each has its death festival, having to do with seasons. Skulls and bones, boys, skeletons and ghosts. In Egypt, lads... See the death of Osiris, king of the dead, gaze long. The boys gazed, for they had come to a vast hole in the underground cavern, and through this hole they could look out on an Egyptian village where, at dusk, food was being placed out in pottery and copper dishes on porches and sills. For the homecoming ghosts? whispered mound shrouds somewhere in the shadows. Rows of oil lamps were nailed to the house fronts, and the soft smoke from these rose up on the twilight air like wandering spirits. You could almost see the haunts shifting along the cobbled streets. The shadows leaned away from the lost sun in the west and tried to enter the houses. But the warm food steaming on the porches, kept the shadows circling and stirring. A faint smell of incense and mummy dust wafted up to the boys who looked out upon this ancient Halloween, and the treats being set forth, not for wandering boys, but homeless ghosts. Hey, whispered all the boys. Don't lose your way in the dark. Voices sang in the houses to the harps and lutes. 
Oh, sweet dad, come home and welcome here. Lost in the dark, but always dear. Do not wander, do not roam. Dear ones, come home, come home. Smoke curled from the dim lamps, and the shadows stepped up on the porches and very gently touched the gifts of food. And in one house they could see an old grandfather mummy being taken out of a closet and put in the place of honor at the head of the table, with food set before him. The members of the family sat down to their evening meal and lifted their glasses and drank to the dead one seated there, all dust and dry silence.